Dragon, SpaceX on two, go going ahead. Dragon to ground. I have to apologize, I didn't get yeah, Just checking in, is the crew no exercise um, constraint band that is currently about to expire, if that will be uh, extended based on the current um, delay? Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. Can you repeat your last? I'm going to mute my other channels and listen only to you. You know, Jake, I don't have the ability to do that, so I'd like to wait for this conversation to end on the big loop, and then I'll repeat it. So a quick recap of our current situation, Crew Dragon Endeavor still holding at waypoint two, just about 20 minutes away from its dock, intended docking port on the International Space Station. We've got about two hours, a little less now, of consumables, uh, essentially propellant, where we can continue to hold here at waypoint two while we troubleshoot an issue getting video over to the crew monitoring on board the space station. So that's one of the uh, checks we have to have in place uh, for their ability to monitor final approach. So the Pluto flight controller here in Houston is going through a number of steps uh, right now, trying to get them video through an alternate pack uh, through a video program on board. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground, ready to copy. Jake, what I was saying is, in anticipation of uh, some kind of a practice, protracted delay here, we have raised our visors, so be sure to double-check with us uh, if and when we get cleared to go back in. Dragon, copy all. Visors raised and absolutely understand. Uh, we'll be in touch uh, with any sort of forward plan. I'm sure you're copying on the big loop that troubleshooting is occurring. On the ISS side, uh, we've got a lot of chatter on the ground about what to do here. Uh, thank you for your patience. Understand visors are up, and I'll be in touch with more shortly. Good work, Jake. Thank you. And the AX-1 crew taking their visors up, seats or their suits not pressurized. Uh, as they continue to hold just 20 meters away from station. So again, we'll continue to hold here at waypoint two. Uh, the teams here on the ground troubleshooting issues, find, trying to find now an alternate path to get that centerline camera video to Rajachari and the crew on station who have to monitor during that final approach. Uh, if their current troubleshooting doesn't work, we've got a ground pass coming up in about 24, 25 minutes from now um, where Dragon will be passing over a SpaceX-supported ground site, which also has the capability to get that centerline video down, and then we'll have another option to try and route that over to the space station crew. So, troubleshooting continued. We're going to wait until we get the centerline camera video up and running before we continue with the docking, uh, but for now we're just stepping through the troubleshooting. So, with that, why don't we jump over and check in with Andy and Tricia, uh, as again, we're just standing by here for this issue to get resolved. So, Andy? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, Trish and I are also, you know, standing by, and uh, hopefully we hear good news uh, from all of the folks uh, here uh, 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 back on Earth uh, trying to troubleshoot the video issue. Um, you know, as you, uh, you, as you had mentioned, um, it's been otherwise a very, very smooth ride uphill, and this is really the first hiccup that we've seen. So, again, um, we have a couple of options that we are looking into, but uh, for now, um, Dragon is just parked about 20 meters away at waypoint two, waiting for a path forward. So Dragon has been uh, on its journey to the International Space Station um, 
for about 20 hours now. And so after Dragon had separated from Falcon 9, it began what we call the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. During this phase, Dragon uh, uh, was configured for on-orbit operations. This phase begins after Dragon separates from Falcon 9 and ends with the completion of the final colliptic burn. The initial orbit that uh, the Dragon was in was about 190 kilometers by 210 kilometers. Those values represented the perigee and the apogee of the orbit respectively, or in other words, the lowest and the highest point over Earth. That means that the orbit wasn't a perfect circle, but you know, more like a, a slight ellipse. Yeah, and over um, the next couple of hours, Dragon executed a series of burns, which gradually raised its orbit to align more closely with the station. Um, on screen right now is a graphic. Um, so there are four major burns or firing of the Draco thrusters on Dragon that uh, brought the spacecraft closer and closer to the ISS. The first was a boost burn. Um, this is based on orbital data and um, this raises Dragon's orbit until its orbit reaches an altitude of just 10 kilometers lower than the space station. It was followed soon after by a close co elliptic burn uh, to place, uh, that placed Dragon on an orbit roughly co elliptic with the space station, which means that the crew was about 10 kilometers lower than the station during the entire orbit uh, around the Earth. The third maneuver is the transfer burn, where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or the highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers below the station. And then we rounded everything out with a final co-elliptic burn to once again maintain a constant orbit beneath the station, this time just 2.5 kilometers below it. That's where we picked up to get into the approach initiation phase and the final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the space station. This was also when uh, integrated operations between the Dragon control team located here in Hawthorne and the space station flight controllers in Mission Control Houston uh, started. The teams transitioned to integrated operations about 45 minutes uh, right before approach initiation. Yeah, that's really where we began um, our, our broadcast just over two hours ago. During the approach, SpaceX flight controllers worked in tandem with NASA teams in Houston to activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including the bi-directional communications that Dan mentioned earlier uh, with the station using the C2V2 system, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles. Um, this also sets up data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. We also maneuver Dragon to the proper attitude or orientation and initialize the navigation sensors used for the methodical approach to the station. And a little bit of time ago, the Draco thrusters on Dragon fired for the approach initiation burn when uh, the Dragon was about two and a half kilometers below the station and just about seven kilometers behind it. That swung Dragon up until it was about 400 meters directly below the station. And that maneuver also moved Dragon inside one of the two safety zones that Dan mentioned earlier around the station that required a set of go or no go poles with the different control teams. Yeah, the first um, zone is called the approach ellipsoid. It's an, uh, essentially an imaginary um, uh, shape measuring four kilometers by um, two kilometers by two kilometers, essentially a large three-dimensional oval around the International Space Station. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside this ellipsoid, uh, referred to the teams as the AE, it's configured to be what is known as um, a 24-hour safe trajectory. And now what this means is that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of all of its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its orbital path would take it inside of the approach ellipsoid. So once Dragon uh, arrived at 400 meters below the station, that was where uh, it was the waypoint zero, which was the first checkpoint during Dragon's approach. Uh, the vehicle could hold at 400 meters, uh, but in this instance, uh, continued on as all systems checked out to approach uh, to waypoint one and uh, through it. Yeah, at this point, the teams uh, passed through waypoint one and continued on to waypoint two. This is where we're currently at, so we're inside that keep out sphere, which is again in, in sort of another imaginary sphere around um, the International Space Station, this time um, uh, 200 meters uh, in radius. 
And um, at Waypoint 2, we are currently holding to troubleshoot some video issues um, of a Dragon. So we have feed um, of Dragon looking at the docking adapter of the International Space Station. The folks here on ground can also see that video, but uh, there is a disconnect between um, the video feed to the International Space Station. So there are um, a couple of paths that we are continuing to look at. Um, uh, and hopefully we can update from the team soon and we can proceed with docking. So while we're waiting for some updates, uh, it's worth discussing, discussing excuse me, uh, the mission patch of the AX-1 mission. So at the heart of the patch is the venerable ISS itself, which is the core of this pioneering private research mission, reflects AX-1's role as a precur precursor for future activity in low Earth orbit and a key step toward the, towards the ISS's commercial successor, Axiom Station. The flags of the four countries adorn the ISS in the middle there in the form of its solar arrays. It represents the multinational crew and reinforces the importance of international collaboration and exploration. And in the background, a cascading plane of blue uh, represents Earth's atmosphere and the journey humanity has traveled to arrive in this new era among the first steps in expanding the human presence in low Earth orbit. The four bright stars you see kind of at the top there, one for each crew member and an atom at the center of that constellation represents the expedition's scientific and aspirational goals. The very top, the last name of each crew member, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria of the USA and Spain, Pilot Larry Connor of the USA, Mission Specialist Mark Pathy of Canada, and Mission Specialist Eitan Stibba of Israel adorn the top of the design. The bottom highlights the Earth overflown while the mission's historic significance is spelled out in the first private crew to the ISS. The golden border around the edge of the patch is inspired by the logo of Rakia, the mission's name in Stiba's home country, which marks the significance of this mission to the people of Israel as it's really their return to flight uh, in honor of their first Israeli astronaut, Elon Ramon. So, you know, Andy, it's certainly a patch filled with a lot of significance and a lot of meaning to the crew. Yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite patches. I especially love the uh, atom symbol in the middle representing all this cool science that the team is going to do. Um, uh, earlier in the launch webcast, we saw inside the capsule, uh, there are the patches of Demo 2 and Crew 2, which this capsule um, uh, has flown before. And so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this 
this patch will also join the other two patches inside the capsule of the dragon. Absolutely, and if you're hearing some noise in the background of our uh, broadcast, it's worth mentioning that we are in a rocket factory here at uh, SpaceX Hawthorne, so there's still a lot of activity going on even early in the morning um, on Saturday. Yeah, um, things really don't stop around here at SpaceX, so it is uh, just after 5 a.m. on a Saturday, but um, production is starting to pick up again. Um, and that's really just par for the course here for us at SpaceX. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly going to be a busy time for SpaceX uh, with, you know, the launches that are upcoming in the next couple weeks. Um, so talking a little bit more on the uh, members of the AX-1 crew. Um, so our mission commander is Michael Lopez Alegria, who is a decorated um, former NASA astronaut. He calls, uh, he was born in Madrid, Spain, and has also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts home. He is a new U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz, so he's certainly no stranger to low Earth orbit life. And he has conducted 10 spacewalks in his career, which means, you know, extravehicular activity outside of the ISS. And that's accumulated into 67 hours and 40 minutes in the vacuum of space, both of which are NASA records. Um, and in 2021, he was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. And uh, sitting next to MLA is the pilot for AX-1, uh, Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Larry is an entrepreneur and a nonprofit activist investor. He has won aerobatic flying competitions and summited both Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier. Through, AX through AX-1, he will become the first private pilot to reach the International Space Station. He will also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and enter the bounds of outer space within one year. Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. And this mission will add a new dimension of several, new dimension to several of these studies. Can I just say the deepest depths of space and then all the way to low Earth orbit? I mean, that is, that is wild. I can't even imagine wow. that. Uh, and then our mission specialist one, Eitan Stiva, is now the second Israeli ever to fly to space. Eitan served for more than four decades as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, where he received the Distinguished Aviator Medal. And today, he is an impact investor and philanthropist. I mentioned earlier what a special mission this is for Eitan and the country of Israel. Uh, he's uh, working under the banner of the Rakia uh, mission, um, which uh, has the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. Uh, during his time on the ISS, he'll facilitate several scientific, exper uh, scientific experiments, educational outreach, as well as artistic activities. And rounding out our crew, Mark Pathy is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, as well as the mission specialist, too, on this AX-1 mission. Pathy is currently the chief executive officer and chairman of Montreal-based Maverick, a privately owned investment and financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. As a strong believer in the importance of philanthropy, Pathy is a member of the boards and executive committees of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, Don LaRue, and the Pathy Family Foundation. Through the AX-1 mission, Pathy has become Canada's second private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go into space. So yeah, that was our four crew members. And again, they are um, inside of our Dragon Capsule Endeavor, just parked about 20 meters away from the International Space Station. Uh, again, waiting on um, some uh, video troubleshooting um, uh, that the teams here on the ground are currently working through. Um, if you are just joining us, this is uh, a live um, uh, mission uh, for the AX-1 mission, and the crew is uh, was moments away from docking with the International Space Station until we ran into a little bit of a hiccup. But again, we have some uh, primary and backup plans um, that we're working through to hopefully get that video feed to the International Space Station and resume docking operations.
And we've, you know, throughout this whole process, we've really heard uh, uh, mission control here at SpaceX, uh, as well as mission control over in Houston, really in lockstep with each other in integrated operations. It really highlights how much of a collaborative effort um, things like this are. You know, there's a uh, saying in the industry that space is hard, and rightfully so. It's very complex to put a human into space safely. You know, the safety of the crew, um, you know, both in the Dragon capsule and and also on the ISS is paramount um, and it's you know, always the number one focus. So everyone, you, you really want to make sure that each step that you take, you're confirmed that everything is um, you know, good to go. Yeah, and, and that's why as part of the procedures, we, we have these holds built into the operations and, and to, to verify all of the checks um, in this particular uh, moment. Um, uh, confirming that that video feed on the International Space Station side uh, is part of the flight operation. So again, the team is going through and doing their due diligence to make sure that uh, everything is set up and safe for uh, the Dragon capsule to um, go ahead and dock with the International Space Station. Absolutely. And in preparation for, you know, troubleshooting moments like this or, you know, just generally uh, life aboard the ISS or, you know, going through launches like this, um, the crew members also have to go through several hours of training. I mean, like, they went through 700 to 8,000 hours of training starting in August of 2021. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of investment of time and resources that they put into um, preparing for this mission. I mean, they really went above and beyond. Yeah, the International Space Station and the Dragon capsule are uh, have just passed over Peru. Um, again, continuing to circle the Earth, we are in an orbital um, daytime, um, but again, we are still holding at waypoint zero or waypoint um, two, uh, about 20 meters away from um, the docking adapter. So Andy, there's no doubt that the incredible efforts of thousands of folks across NASA over the last two decades have set the stage for you know what is possible in low Earth orbit. The AX-1 mission is a critical step towards opening these possibilities to a host of new participants, you know, governments, diverse researchers, manufacturers, and more people. Um, here on Earth, we're already seeing benefits from research currently conducted on the ISS from water and air purification systems to testing medical devices as well as therapeutics. In addition to tech demos uh, and medical research, access to low Earth orbit allows for a connection to the arts and other outreach opportunities. AX-1 is the first of several proposed missions in the advance of uh, Axiom Station, the world's first commercial space station. A sustainable commercial low Earth orbit economy means that um, expanded access to work in space is um, available. It also uh, frees up NASA and its partners to put their budget towards other exploration programs while granting space agencies around the world more opportunities through commercial efforts. Absolutely. You know, and over its lifetime, the ISS has accomplished an unprecedented feat. It's continuously sustained operations on and off the Earth for more than 20 years, which is not only a true testament to the technology required to physically achieve that, but also to the collaborative and cooperative efforts of thousands of people across the world to ensure that multiple nations, agencies, and entities, both public and private, work together to push humanity forward. And, you know, as we move forward, private industries like Axiom Space need, to, need time to learn how to establish and maintain those relationships effectively. So by flying our private astronaut missions like AX-1 uh, to the ISS, Axiom is taking essential steps to get that on-the-job training as we work towards building the fir world's first commercial space station. Axiom Station is an opportunity to continue the story of the ISS. Science and research through cooperation and collaboration on a global scale for the benefit of all. So, you know, AX1 is really uh, the next chapter. Yeah. Uh, for now, um, as we continue to wait for updates um, of the video troubleshooting issue, we are going to check in with Dan uh, over at JSC in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy and Tricia. And so just current status, we're still hanging out at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters away. We are coming up 
on our next troubleshooting steps though. So uh, the issue we ran into a little bit earlier is getting what's known as the center line camera. So that's that camera view directly uh, right down the middle of essentially the docking hatch of Dragon pointing at the docking port on station. And one of our flight rules requires that video to be visible on board the space station for the crew monitoring Dragon during its final approach after we proceed in from waypoint two. So the teams have gone through a couple of steps to try and troubleshoot th that to get the video up to the crew. Uh, we have coming up in just a couple of minutes a ground pass. Um, so a couple of things are going to happen over the next few minutes. First, we're going to get uh, our KU coverage back with the space station in about a minute, minute and a half. So we'll get views back from the space station. We'll also get that high rate data link uh, where we can essentially also send video signals up to the station crew. And about 723 central, so in about two minutes, uh, Dragon's going to be doing a pass over a SpaceX ground site which offers another path to get video from Dragon down to the ground. So the teams are going to take that video, ingest it, bring it over here to Mission Control Houston, send it back up to the station crew through another route to hopefully get it into their station support Houston computer on the big for them to for do status. that monitoring. Yeah, Roger, wanted to give you a heads up on our plan here. Any moment now, we are expecting KU to come back at this point. We're going to route some camera views um, so that we can see uh, Dragon better from the ground here. At 12.23, so about one minute from now, we are expecting to get a video feed from SpaceX that will just come to MCC Houston over here. That's going to last about five minutes. Our plan is we are going to check the alignment, make sure that Dragon is in good position. As long as those checks work, we are going to press ahead uh, with the docking attempt. How copy so far? Okay, copy about 12.23. You guys will get video to MCC for about five minutes. You guys are going to check the alignment on the ground, and if you're happy, you'll uh, plan to press ahead. And that's a good copy, Raja, and we will let you know when we're pressing in. Stand by. Dragon, Captain Tom, Tom Scott on Segez Dragon to Ground, the I'm sure you copied all on the big loop. Uh, stand by. Uh, we're zipping up a plan here, uh, and I'll let you know before we command resume. So again, right now we're standing by for Dragon to make that pass over our SpaceX ground site, the plan. We've now got some additional cameras trained on Dragon, just giving the team's additional alignment insight into the capsule as it still hangs out 20 meters away from the docking port. We're just beginning a pass over station ground sites now, and teams are going to work to get that video up to the crew. This ground site pass will last for about five minutes. And that means the video will likely not be available for the entirety of that final approach. However, Dragon, the SpaceX, way the flight on rules the are loop, written, confirm crew readiness for final approach. SpaceX, Endeavor, copy all. We're ready. Visors down. And again, as long as the teams Dragon, have this SpaceX, data now, on the big we're able to confirm imminent. good alignment. Dragon is entering approach two. And Dragon's flight computer getting into approach two. Perhaps so we've Denver, gotten that video. We've been able to confirm alignment here on the ground. The NASA flight director and the SpaceX mission director have conferred. And confirm Dragon is in good alignment. We have additional tools available, uh, giving us degrees off of the of the we'll be hands off at two meters. Good copy, Dragon. All right. So Dragon is now accelerating in for docking. So again. We were able to get that ground pass video. The teams here in Houston, 
visiting vehicle officer, other support personnel confirmed Dragon was in good alignment. And that video from the ground site, that's the one you were just seeing on the left. So Dragon's now continuing in towards docking. We've departed waypoint two. We're only 17 and a half meters away. We confirmed good alignment. And we've got additional views now trained on Dragon, giving additional situational awareness. We're continuing to get those updates from the navigational equipment on board Dragon. The LIDAR's giving real-time range rate. Uh, we're getting real-time degrees, and that's also being fed to the crew in real time. They don't have that video, but they do have all that additional data that's able to give them uh, enough data to make decisions for a board if they need to. So we have proceeded. We are go for docking. Dragon's flying in. It's moving at less than a tenth of a meter per second. We're just about 15 meters away now from the docking port on the space-facing side of Node 2. Should be just under three minutes away from docking. And you can see the soft capture ring on the docking mechanisms extended. It's got three of those slightly triangular looking shapes and those are the pedals that are going to be used to guide it in to the passive docking me mechanism on the station side. After that makes the initial attachment, that docking ring is going to retract, bring it in, and then it's going to be able to make a hard mate, engaging 12 hooks to give a, the hard, hard mate, the hard dock um, to the space station. SpaceX copies, 10 meters. So 10 meters again. Once we get to about six meters, you're going to hear the crew call out chop. That's the crew hands off point. That's just giving direction to the crew on board Dragon not to make any manual control decisions or movements as everything gets handled by the flight computer from that point in. Eight meters away. Continuing to get confirmation the Dragon is in the correct attitude in the approach corridor. Not tracking any issues, just past seven meters from the docking port. Six meters in closing. The International five Docking meters. Adapter number three in view Basics on the lower copies, right there. Five meters. Under five meters to go. Still seeing good alignment. Under three meters. Soft docking ring on dragon on top there. International docking adapter Basics on the right. Copies, two meters. Two meters. We heard chop call. The crew hands off point. One meter. One meter to go. Dragon, SpaceX, yes. on the big loop, contact soft and soft capture complete, attenuation in progress. SpaceX Endeavor, copy all, good. All right, so with that contact and capture coming at 7.29 a.m. Central Time, 5.29 a.m. Eastern, that's 12.29 UTC, while the station and Dragon flew 258 statute miles over the Central Atlantic Ocean. So with that initial contact made, the soft capture ring is now going to begin to retract. Dragon, After that is SpaceX, completed, on the big we'll be able to start engaging ring hooks. retraction in progress. Soft 
capture ring in progress. So we're now going to see Dragon inch a little bit closer to that docking adapter until it essentially performs a sealed connection. And then we'll be able to engage 12 hooks that uh, form the hard capture function onboard Dragon. Six of those are actually engaged during the launch and on the way into orbit. And they hold the nose cone, which you can see opened off to the right there. They hold that in place uh, and then they're opened up once we're on orbit to deploy the nose cone. Uh, but 12 of those are now going to engage after the soft capture ring has retracted. Once those 12 are engaged, we'll have a hard mate. Then we can start co to connect two umbilicals that are going to uh, provide hard line data and power to Dragon through station systems. And then we'll be able to get the docking complete call. And then it's on to uh, some of the post docking operations. So for the crew inside Dragon, they'll be getting out of their suits. Uh, doing some basic cabin configuration as they get ready to open the hatch on their side. Uh, that'll be the last hatch to open. Uh, meanwhile, on the station side, uh, Tom Marshburn and the Expedition 67 crew will start outfitting what's called the A-pass hatch. That's the hatch on the station side. It's got a small valve that Marshburn's going to open up to begin to flow atmosphere to the space between the Dragon and the station hatches. Right now, it's still exposed to vacuum. But as soon as we're able to pull Dragon in and engage those hooks, uh, that will become a sealed uh, sealed space. And so we'll be able to pressurize it, essentially just flowing atmosphere from the station into that previously vacuum space between the two hatches. We'll stop a couple of times on the way up in the pressure uh, just to do leak checks and let thermals equalize to make sure that we're actually measuring pressure and how much atmosphere is in there, not just thermal fluctuations. Um, and so once we get that up to pretty much the same ambient pressure as the space station, we'll open the A-pass hatch first, and then it'll be over to the Dragon crew to open the hatch into Crew Dragon Endeavor. So still waiting for that soft capture ring to retract. Um, this might be a bit of deja vu for Dragon Commander Mike L.A. as this is actually the second time in his spaceflight career that he's docked to the space station on a spacecraft named Endeavour. Uh, he flew on Shuttle Endeavour back on STS-113, flying to the station in November of 2002 to deliver the Expedition 6 crew. So thank you to our resident spaceflight encyclopedia for that tidbit. So for now, the soft capture ring's still retracting, and once that's completed, uh, we'll be able to begin connecting those hooks. And those are going to hold it in place. We'll get those umbilicals, and then we'll be able to start stepping into hatch operations. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Ring retraction complete. Docking sequence is holding for MCS reconfiguration. And that soft capture ring has retracted. Uh, as you heard, we're going to now stand by for a moment for MCS reconfigure. That's the motion control system on board station. For the docking ops, we were we had handed over to the thrusters on the Russian segment for propulsive attitude control. Uh, now that the soft capture is completed, we're going to hand back over to the gyroscopes, the large gyroscopes on the U.S. segment that are just run electronically to provide non-propulsive attitude control to the station. And then once that handover is complete, we'll start engaging those 12 hooks, holding Dragon in place, and then getting closer to that docking complete call. But um, if you're just joining the docking, that initial contact and capture did take place uh, just about five minutes ago at 7.29 a.m. Central, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1229 GMT, as uh, both the station and Dragon were flying 258 statute miles over the Atlantic, connecting the spacecraft to the station, carrying the first all-private astronaut mission to station the Oregon Houston. lab. MCS is configured. Proceeding with hook driving. Station copies.
and we now have the motion control system on the station reconfigured back in uh, attitude control being done by the U.S. gyroscopes, and they're now going to start engaging those 12 hooks uh, on the Dragon capsule. All right, we've got confirmation that the hooks have started to drive. And so there's 12 total. We're going to do them in two groups of six. Um, so the, the first set of six driving now. Um, in this split screen view, you've got the newly arrived Dragon Endeavor on the left. On the right there is NASA astronaut and current Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn. Uh, he's on the timeline to take the lead in the vestibule pressurization operation so he's going to be uh, moving into uh, the pressurized mating adapter in the space facing side of node 2 and working on the station side hatch opening up a valve to uh, start to flow atmosphere from station into that uh, soon to be sealed pressurized area between the two hatches and again we expect hatch opening to take place roughly two hours uh, should be a little bit less than two hours following a docking. Um, so with that docking happening uh, right around 7.30 Central, um, it'll probably be uh, sometime uh, in the 9 o'clock hour uh, before we get the hatches open. For the crew on board, they're going to remain in their seats throughout this as we continue to drive the hooks. And then once those hooks are driven and docking is complete, we will be able to uh, have them get out of the suits. Uh, that'll be one of the first items for them. Uh, they'll also begin to just reconfigure the cabin. And we just got confirmation six of those hooks are engaged, so the first set is good. And then the second set is now driving. And again, first set of hooks are in place. Second set of six hooks are now driving. And once we get those in place and get uh, the umbilicals deployed, we'll have docking complete. And then the crew will be able to get out of their suits on board of Dragon. Uh, they'll start to reconfigure the cabin. One of the first things that they'll do uh, once we get hatches open is to remove what's called a lyo canister. It's lithium hydroxide. That's the system used on board of Dragon to scrub CO2 from the air. They just remove it and put a seal over it as um, they've got a couple of essentially cartridges that get used while Dragon's in free flight um, and as they're going to be integrating Dragon's atmosphere with the rest of station uh, they'll take that out and then they'll be able to rely on uh, the station atmospheric revitalization systems uh, scrubbing CO2 providing oxygen uh, for the duration of their docked visit. Um, once they get on board and I'll address this a few times. We usually get asked, where's everybody going to sleep? As we now have 11 people uh, on board the space station. Uh, for the AX-1 crew, they're going to be split up in a couple of different areas. One will sleep inside of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one will set up a, a temporary sleep location in the Quest airlock. And then we'll have two spots inside of the European Columbus module. Um, one in the newly fabricated CASA, the it's essentially a new uh, crew quarters set up there, uh, the roughly closet-sized uh, private booths SpaceX that we have on, the on board the station with complete. four uh, over in Node 2. SpaceX Endeavor hard capture complete.
And there's the call. Hard capture is complete. So all 12 hooks engaged and in place. Next up for some umbilicals, but Dragon now firmly attached to the space station. We see the visors come up on the crew inside, and we can start now stepping into some of the operations to get those hatches open and get these AX-1 astronauts on board the station. So with that, I'm going to send it over to the team in Hawthorne. Andy, Trisha, congratulations on docking the first private astronaut mission to station. Uh, why don't you take us a little bit for the rest of the way? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, right back at you. Um, uh, that was amazing. And so we did dock uh, about an hour later than scheduled, but I always like to think of it as a silver lining. Uh, we were to, able to get an orbital daytime during the dock, so absolutely gorgeous views of Dragon's approach and contact with the International Space Station. And uh, as Dan had mentioned and, and we heard over the nets, uh, hard capture is complete. We are waiting for umbilicals to be plugged in and installed, um, but Dragon is now firmly secured to the International Space Station, so um, docking procedures can uh, continue um, and eventually the crew will make their way out of Dragon and onto the International Space Station. I mean, oh my gosh, it's just incredibly exciting to watch that. I mean, watching the whole process of Dragon approaching uh, the <clears throat> docking adapter and then, you know, completing that dock was just, I mean, personally for me, I was very, very excited. So I can only imagine what the crew is feeling like right now. This is, you know, like setting off the rest of the uh, eight days that they're going to have on orbit. So just an incredibly exciting time and very special for everyone involved. Yeah, and, and absolutely an incredible effort from the teams to um, troubleshoot that issue and get things going. Um, that is really what uh, the joint operations and, and, uh, and space is about. Uh, you had mentioned it earlier, space is not easy, <laughs> um, but you know, it takes a lot of very dedicated, uh, talented, smart, uh, 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 hardworking folks uh, to make sure these things are done safely. So, um, yeah, with uh, the crew uh, now one step closer to um, uh, getting on board the International Space Station and starting all the cool science that, uh, you know, I'm sure they're excited to do. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, docking sequence complete. I hope you enjoyed the extra half orbit in Dragon or at least found it memorable. Crew Dragon Endeavor and MLA, welcome back. Aton, Larry, Mark, welcome to the International Space Station. SpaceX Endeavor, we copy all. We're happy to be here, even though we're a bit uh, late and looking forward to the uh, next chapter. Thanks for all the great work. On behalf of SpaceX, it's been a pleasure working with you. At this time, ground will be enabling power and comm connections. You are go to doff suits for procedure 4.012. We'll bring the cameras external shortly. Thanks, Jake. We're moving to 4.012. An endeavor from MCCH. Welcome to the International Space Station. We are looking forward to uh, this historic mission. MCCH Endeavor, thanks for all the great work. We're looking forward to uh, moving uh, into the ISS with the uh, other crews. We're looking forward to it, Endeavor. Welcome aboard. So uh, some final exchanges as uh, the crew on board Capsule Endeavor begin to doff or take off their spacesuits. Uh, in the past, they've actually just left. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No response required. Cameras are external. In the past, uh, I think uh, what we've seen is the, the suits are just kind of left in the seats, strapped in, and, and they're stored in the Dragon. Um, but it is uh, quite a, a, 
a funny scene to see the astronauts kind of floating around gathering their belongings and there's like these four mannequins <laughs> sitting in the seats uh, but they're getting ready um, there um, there are a couple more operations that needs to happen before we can open both of the hatches so um, as Dan was mentioning the a pass hatch on the International Space Station side um, will open first um, prior to that we're going to fill the vestibule which is the space between the two hatches we're going to fill that with um, air and pressure uh, to make sure that um, it is equalized on both sides. Then we'll open the A-pass hatch, then the Dragon hatch will open, and then uh, the crews can meet. Station Houston for Tom on the big loop. Go ahead, Houston, on the big loop. Yes, sir, better late than never, but we can now give you a go to get into uh, ingress part one. And specifically, you have a go through 1.1 and 2.2. Copy 1.1 and 2.1, I have a go for the part one of the hatch opening. Copy that. Also, you have a go in 2.2 when you get there. So again, beginning the initial steps for hatch open uh, on both sides. Uh, so uh, with that, you know, it's been outside of the, the small hiccup with video, smooth ride up um, uh, to the International Space Station. Absolutely. The crew has certainly been on a long journey starting bright and early yesterday, April 8th, for, uh, you know, when they arrived to uh, launch pad 39A, leading all the way up to launch at 8.17 a.m. Eastern and 11.17 a.m. Pacific on April 8th. And now, you know, just having completed uh, the docking sequence and now they're beginning hatch operations it's just very exciting to see um the whole journey that they've been through yeah the crew has been uh, in space and in dragon for almost a day actually um we're we're coming up on 23 or 24 hours in inside the capsule um on board they were able to eat a couple of meals um they had a sleep and rest period they we we did an onboard uh, live event earlier uh, this morning um, so I'm sure the crew is super excited to, uh, you know, take off those spacesuits and uh, get uh, head their way uh, into the International Space Station. And this here is a great view of Dragon. It is docked at the uh, Zenith port. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon ground. Cabin check. Sorry, cabin mic check. Dragon, SpaceX on the cabin mic, we have you 5x5. Five five. Glad to hear you loud and clear again. Lots of exciting things happening. Uh, with that, Yeah, let's... same here. Do you want me to do another comp big loop? At this point, I'm expecting it's a suit issue. Uh, that's not gospel, but um, I, we're, I think we're good. Uh, oh, I understand. Yeah, com mic com check on the big loop would be good. Cabin mic on the big loop. It's such Endeavor on the big loop. Cabin mic check. Endeavor SpaceX on the big loop. Cabin mic check five by five. Copy all. Thanks, Jake. Uh, so we are going through some checks. This is a view of Dragon docked at the Zenith or space fairing, a space facing port. Uh, so uh, the uh, hatch is actually pointing down towards Earth. Um, and the crew is inside, again, doffing their spacesuits or taking off their spacesuits, getting ready to enter the uh, International Space Station here shortly. Uh, for now, we're going to send it back over to Dan at, jo at Johnson Space Center in Houston. 
Hey, thanks, Andy. Yeah, we are now docked and ready to get into hatch ops. So uh, pretty soon we're going to start flowing air through a small valve uh, in the station's A-pass hatch. It's just the hatch on the station side uh, into what's known as the vestibule. That's just that small space that before docking is just exposed to vacuum. Uh, but now with Dragon firmly attached, we've got a tight seal uh, and we're going to start uh, pressurizing that section. So we're going to do it uh, in a couple of steps. Um, Station Commander Tom Marshburn is going to be primed for this. Um, and first thing uh, is he's right now in Node 2 uh, in the Harmony module, and here's a live view. Uh, first, he's working to open up um, what's known as the uh, PMA hatch, so the hatch into the pressurized mating adapter. This is closed during the docking operations. And with that, Tom Marshburn has that PMA hatch open. So you can see now inside the pressurized mating adapter, uh, we do use it for storage um, as space is limited on board the station. So number of items stored, but you can see the cover uh, to the A-pass hatch now uh, in view. So Marshburn is going to go there. He's going to open a small valve. It's going to start flowing uh, atmosphere from the station into the vestibule and we're going to slowly pressurize that. Uh, we're going to use sensors on the dragon hatch to measure temperature and uh, pressure inside of the vestibule as that happens. The station on the big loop, no two overhead hatches. And so right open. now he's going to... Copy. Hatch open. Thanks, Tom. And so Marshburn just radioing down the, the overhead hatch so the hatch into the, the pressurized mating adapter is open. He's grabbed a tablet with his procedures on and he's going to now start stepping through uh, the vestibule pressurization. So he's going to open a small equalization valve um, and that's going to start flowing air uh, from station into that vestibule. Um, we're going to give it some time uh, for those hatch seals inside to relax. Um, is we're going to be introducing a pretty substantial thermal change for them. Um, so again, as we're as we're measuring pressure inside, we want to ensure that that's not just the air heating up, but we're getting a, an accurate reading of how much atmosphere is now in that vestibule. And we're going to continue this pressurization until you essentially equalize the pressure between uh, the vestibule and the station and Dragon. They're all going to be at a very similar pressure. We can wait for pressures to equalize um, so we can uh, just kind of pause and wait uh, but at this point the vestibule pressurization has started it sounds like uh, we're getting that valve open um, and so we're going to start stepping through so this all told um, will take about 10 minutes to start the, the pressurization uh, and then after that we're going to do a leak check that can go anywhere from 15 minutes up. Oh, quick view of Raja Chari, who's doing our primary dragon monitoring there. Uh, but after we get the vestibule pressurized, we'll, we'll go into a leak check uh, where they just, again, they wait for thermal conditions to stabilize. They're able to uh, do a leak check and then ensure that the vestibule is pressure tight. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground, no response required. ISS crew are stepping into vestibule pressurization imminently. You are free to follow along with telemetry in 4.400 section 4 if you'd like. Houston Station. 
position on the big loop. Eight pass equalization valve is open for 75 seconds. Now closed at the GMT 1255. Twelve five five copy. We will take care of the leak check from the ground. Give you a heads up here in just a little bit. Copy. And so as we just heard the Dragon crew get told, the vestibule pressurization is beginning. So again, that's done on the station side. Again, this is Mission Control Houston. So Dragon currently docked to the International Space Station. They linked up with the space facing port on No2, the Harmony module, uh, just about 30 minutes ago, docking at 7.29 a.m. Central, uh, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, while the station and Dragon were flying just 258 statute miles over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we did hang out at Waypoint 2, just about 20 minutes away. Uh, while we were troubleshooting, uh, while we were troubleshooting a uh, video issue, getting it over to the the station crew for monitoring, but we were able to effect a workaround. Teams on the ground confirming that Dragon was in uh, the proper alignment, proper attitude, and then the capsule was able to get the go for final approach, and then link up. So, with the docking complete, Dragon firmly attached, we're into hatch ops. So. Tom Marshburn has started the pressurization of the vestibule, that space between the two hatches, and we're going to continue that and then execute a leak check, which can take anywhere from 15 minutes up to an hour, just depending on uh, what kind of readings we start getting back. We're going to be using sensors on the Dragon hatch for tracking pressure, temperature, everything uh, inside that vestibule. Meanwhile, the crew on board Dragon is able to now get out of their suits, that they were wearing for that dynamic phase of rendezvous and docking. And then once uh, they're out of there, they can monitor the hatch ops from their side 
And then once everything is done uh, with the station crew getting the vestibule pressurized, they'll open up the station side hatch first, and then it'll be over to the AX-1 crew to open the hatch on Dragon. And then after we get the hatches open, the Expedition 67 crew will be able to welcome them on board. And we will have a welcome ceremony um, sometime after hatch open. Uh, could take as long as 30 minutes as there are a couple of steps they have to uh, take just after we get the hatches open just to get Dragon configured for docked operations, including taking some steps just to start integrating Dragon's cabin atmosphere with that on board the space station. Uh, and then we'll get the entire Expedition 67 crew, all seven of them, uh, along with the recently arrived AX-1 astronauts all together and have a special ceremony to welcome the first private astronaut mission to the space station. We docked about 45 minutes behind schedule uh, per the original timeline, so we are expecting uh, pretty much everything else to shift with that. Um, but we'll continue to give you updates as we get through hatch operations and get ready to bring the crew on board. Station Endeavour, Houston, on the big loop for Timeline Sync. Endeavour's ready to copy. Yes, Station, and Endeavour wanted to give everyone a heads up the way uh, the rest of the day is going to look here with uh, docking occurring 45 minutes late. The intention here is the PAO event and the subsequent safety briefing will slide to the right by 45 minutes, um, which will carry over to the rest of the day. However, we'll let you guys flex and manage. Um, if you're able to make up some time, we are good with that. Otherwise, uh, we'll hang in with you um, as the timeline would be extended a little bit. I'll copy. Copy, and thanks for the flexibility. And you said from Endeavor for awareness, if uh, station is rushing up on those calls, we are not hearing them.
And copy that, LA. We talked to Station on uh, Space to Ground 3 earlier, so they are aware, so we're good and in sync. So thanks for the heads up. Okay, you got it. And LA, we've got you loud and clear, and we're following along on Space to Ground 2. Big loop. Okay, Kayla, thanks. And we just heard an update called up to the crew from the Capcom Scott's Gatey here in Houston. Uh, as mentioned, docking did take place about 45 minutes after the initially intended time, uh, as we did spend extra time at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters away from station, to troubleshoot a video issue, just getting video um, up to the station crew. Uh, we were able to come up with a workaround, teams on the ground, able to confirm Dragon attitude positioning, uh, all within normal bounds. And they did that final approach and that docking happening at 7.29 a.m. Uh, Central, uh, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, that's 12.29 GMT. And that happened while both the station uh, and Dragon were flying just over the central part of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, since then, we're already now into hatch operations. Um, so the vestibule pressurization is underway. Uh, a small uh, relief valve has been opened uh, on the station side to flow atmosphere into that space between the Dragon and station hatches. Uh, we're using sensors on the Dragon hatch to measure uh, that pressurization. Uh, and then we're going to, after it gets up to about ambient pressure with the rest of the station, we're going to pause uh, and we're going to let thermal stabilize and then conduct a leak check just to make sure that we've got a tight seal between the Dragon and the station uh, before we start opening up the hatches. We're going to open the hatch on the station side first. It's called the A-pass hatch. Um, so the station crew will get that open, and then once we, again, confirm pressures are roughly equalized between station Dragon, and Dragon, station, uh, the Dragon on crew the will open up Power their hatch. to Dragon established. They just called up that a, that the power connection to Dragon has been established. So two umbilicals uh, have now been extended and connected between the Dragon spacecraft and the space station. That allows them to have a hard line integration into station power and data. Uh, now Dragon using the station systems uh, to power. Uh, its own uh, its own hardware inside, um, not relying on those solar arrays or any batteries at this point, able to draw power from the station. Uh, Dragon is largely left in a power down mode um, after the crew gets uh, on board. A lot of its systems are put into kind of a quiescent mode while docked, uh, with the SpaceX teams routinely bringing them up um, during the docked mission just to do checkouts. Uh, but for now, they are... Um, hooked in to station power, to station data, um, and then once we get the hatches open, they'll uh, take some steps to integrate the cabin atmosphere and Dragon with that on board the space station, able to rely on the regenerative uh, capabilities of the space station, and then preserve, preserving uh, the consumables on board Dragon, both the, the breathable oxygen and nitrogen, and also the carbon dioxide scrubbing. Um, so those will get essentially taken out of their configs and will get brought back up online when it's time for Dragon to depart. And so at this point, the vestibule has been pressurized and we're now gonna start stepping through those leak checks. Those can take uh, Soon as, as short as about 15 minutes up to an hour, just depends on how long it takes uh, to reach a thermal equilibrium and also just uh, to make sure that we have steady pressure readings, again using sensors on the Dragon hatch to actually perform this leak check. 
Then after we confirm a good leak check, we'll be able to get the go up to the station crew to open up the hatch on their side. Uh, and then it'll be over to the SpaceX team. We, there's usually about 30 minutes um, between those two hatches being opened, uh, the A-Pass coming first, uh, followed shortly after uh, by the Dragon hatch. But things look quiet right now. The crew actually getting some time, uh, the crew on board station uh, getting some time right now for their midday meal uh, before they get ready to get the hatch open and welcome the AX-1 astronauts on board. Uh, right after we get everyone on, we'll have the entire Expedition 67 crew join with the AX-1 uh, astronauts and do a formal welcome ceremony, welcoming uh, the first fully private astronaut mission on board the space station. Following that, there's uh, still a pretty busy day for the rest of the afternoon. Um, the station commander, Tom Marshburn, will take the entire station crew, um, so all of our new astronauts as well as the Expedition 67 ones, and doing a safety briefing. This is routine for any crew members arriving at the space station, whether they're professional astronauts or uh, on these new private astronaut missions. Um, Marshburn, as the commander, has overall safety authority for the crew during the expedition on board, and he'll just go through essentially an orientation session, um, showing where all of the critical safety equipment is located, going over paths toward to safe haven, back to vehicles, hatch closings, uh, things of that nature, um, just giving a safety briefing. Lasts typically about an hour um, before the crew will then go through the rest of their day. Um, Station Commander Marshburn is going to be uh, taking about an hour and a half to do what's known as crew handover with all the newly arrived astronauts, uh, essentially just giving them a tour of the facilities on board, uh, showing them where they're going to be setting up for the duration, uh, and just starting to get them acquainted uh, with their home for uh, more than the next week um, while they're on board. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but we do usually get asked pretty frequently, where's everyone going to sleep? as we do not have 11 crew quarters on board, but we have 11 crew members on the space station now. Um, so for our recently arrived AX-1 crew, uh, one of them is going to sleep inside of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one of them is going to be over in the Quest airlock, um, where we uh, stage spacewalks out of. Uh, we're not doing any spacewalks during this mission or anytime soon, no planned spacewalks. Um, so one crew member will set up in there, and then two will be in the Columbus module. One in the newly installed CASA, the crew quarters um, that's over in Columbus, and then another one just setting up what we typically refer to as a campout configuration, um, also in Columbus. So they'll be spread out throughout the station um, for their time on board. So again, right now, uh, the vestibule has been pressurized. We're going through the leak checks. Uh, that view on the right, uh, a view up towards the docking port. Um, you're looking at the A-pass or the station hatch side. And the Houston station uh, pretty soon for private after we get through. And again, pretty soon after we get through uh, this leak check, the crew on board will get the go to begin opening that hatch. We'll get the station side open first, followed shortly thereafter uh, by the hatch on board Dragon. And then we'll be able to get the AX-1 crew inside and go through a welcome ceremony to welcome these uh, first private astronaut mission crew members on board the station. We'll have a couple of participants here on the ground able to talk to the crew and then their uh, commander Mike LA will go through a short ceremony and then it'll be off and running for the AX-1 mission. They've already got uh, a number of activities both just kind of getting themselves set up uh, but already stepping into some of their science, their outreach activities immediately uh, on this day today. Uh, the entire crew, so everybody on board uh, is scheduled to go to sleep at uh, a little bit later than the normal time, uh, about 4.30 central here in Houston. Uh, we do keep all of the crew on essentially the same sleep schedule whenever possible, um, just so you don't have, obviously, people moving around and turning lights on while you're trying to sleep in low Earth orbit. Um, they typically follow a schedule 
uh, for us here in the U.S. where they're waking up uh, in the middle of the night for us. Uh, in fact, their wake-up time tomorrow will be about 1 a.m. here in Houston, and then they immediately get into a lot of their operations. Since tomorrow is Sunday, um, for most of the Expedition 67 crew, uh, it's going to be a relatively light day. As the weekends are typically an off day for them. They'll have some cleaning tasks, which get scheduled on the weekend. Um, each of the crew members spending about two hours exercising, even on their off days, and that's just to help uh, combat the negative effects on the human body of that extended period of time in microgravity, uh, but largely for the Expedition 67 crew, a day off. But for the AX-1, they have a pack schedule tomorrow. Um, one additional activity that will involve the entire crew, so all 11 uh, individuals on board the station, will be just another um, emergency role and response review. So again, just going over um, what each of the crew members has to do in the event of a contingency. We plan for these, we train for these. Everybody that flies to the space station has to go through that training on the ground, and then they're just getting a refresher now that they're up on board around the real hardware, around the real settings uh, that they would have to make that response. So for right now, we're just continuing to follow. Again, they're doing uh, leak checks right now in the vestibule. That's that space between the two hatches, uh, the hatch on station and the hatch on Dragon. We've pressurized it, uh, opening up the valve and uh, introducing atmosphere from the station into that small space. And so we'll hold here for a while, wait for uh, essentially the leak rate to, to bottom out, make sure we have a tight seal uh, before we can get ready to open up the hatch on the station side first, followed soon after by the hatch on Dragon. And this is Mission Control Houston. So we are still waiting for uh, vestibule leak checks to be completed. Again, it has been pressurized, that small space between the space station and the Dragon. And those leak checks taking anywhere from 15 minutes all the way up to an hour. Um, as was radioed up to the crew, we were about 45 minutes late with docking uh, after doing that video troubleshooting, hanging out at waypoint two. We were originally planning on getting on the, the hatch loop. open. FYI, we're going to reconfigure for hardline comm. It will take down comm to drag in for about two minutes, and we'll give you a call when it comes back. And have a copy. And the Dragon crew getting a heads up. So, as mentioned, Dragon now 
has hardline connections for both power and data to the space station, so they're now going to configure communications to follow through those paths using station systems to come back down to the ground. Uh, Dragon uses the same, while in free flight, the same tracking and data relay satellites as the station, uh, but just so we're not uh, sending an additional wireless signal or at, at a minimum just taking advantage of the station systems, uh, they're going to be switching over to the hardline communications. So while that happens, we're still continuing with the vestibule leak checks. Uh, they have to take some time to, to make sure that uh, the temperature swings steady out inside the vestibule just to ensure that the pressure that we're reading uh, is not uh, caused by any thermal variance, just uh, based off of the actual amount of atmosphere that we float in. And so while we wait for that to continue, uh, the crew on board the station has got some time to go through their midday meal. And meanwhile, the astronauts on board Dragon have given uh, have been given the go to get out of their spacesuits. They they wore those throughout all of the approach and docking procedures, and they're going to wear those for all of the different dynamic phases of the flight. So they were in them for launch, they were in them for docking, they're going to be in them for undocking, and then eventually when they come home on that entry, descent, and landing. But as mentioned, we ended up docking about 45 minutes later than originally intended. Um, so pretty much our entire schedule now shifting about 45 minutes later. We had originally intended to get the hatches open uh, at the bottom of the hour this hour at about 8.30 central. Uh, now looking at getting those hatches open at about 9.15 or so, uh, just depending on how quickly we're able to get through these leak checks and then start to get the hatches open. First, the one on station side and then the one over on Dragon. Um, and so we'll be looking at about the 9 o'clock hour uh, for the hatches to get open, and after which the AX-1 astronauts will make their way on board, and we'll do a formal welcome ceremony with them and the entirety of the Expedition 67 crew. So while we wait for the vestibule leak checks to be completed, taking us one step closer to hatch open, send it back over to Andy and Tricia to tell us a little bit more about this mission, which now attached to the space station. Can't wait to see them on board. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground for cabin configuration update. Jake. Hey Mike, the ISS crew is inching towards a hatch open state. Wanted to check in that the Dragon crew is working towards that as well. We're working toward it, but we aren't going to be dressed for dinner. Copy all Mike, that was perfectly vague and I will uh, leave it to you to configure the cabin. Happy while we're talking about that in 4.400 section three, let me know when you're ready. Hey, I am ready for inventory, go ahead. We haven't touched uh, any food since we last spoke. Um, as far as water, we've taken that same bag uh, out of location nine and are continuing to drink bottles from it. Stand by one. Five of the six bottles have been consumed. Uh, just a question on that. Uh, what, how do you want to account for that? Uh, do you want us to just finish all the bottles that we open and then put it back uh, in, put them back in the bag? Hey, Mike, yeah, I think that's going to be the cleanest way to do it. Um, if you could finish any of the half-consumed bottles. Um, and to be clear, these were coming from bag number what? Copy all. 
Six consumed from bag 204. And then as far as the um, trash that is described in 3.2, we are just going to hand over the uh, duffel from location 21 to the ISS crew, and that will have all of our waste in it, both uh, trash and uh, the, the um, comfort garments that we're wearing now. Okay, copy all, Mike. That sounds right. I'll get back to you if uh, we discover that to not be the correct way forward, uh, but good plan. Okay, thank you. Station Houston on the big loop for Tom. I have on the big loop for Tom. Yeah, Tom, good news. We have passed the leak check, so at this point we can give you a go for your ingress part two activities. Uh, you have a go in step three, decimal one. A go in step three, decimal one of the opening part two. Thank you. Good copy. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, too. So to summarize, we heard a lot of communication back and forth. So this first set of um, communications was between the core, uh, Jake Bendo. Um, core stands for Crew, Crew Operation Resources Engineer, uh, and folks uh, on board the capsule yeah, endeavor. Um, so the core's job is to communicate with folks inside the Dragon capsule. And the second half of that communication uh, was uh, from between the CAPCOM, which stands for uh, Capsule Communicator, uh, to folks at the ISS, so I'm um, speaking to uh, Tom Marshburn. And so um, we'll continue to hear that as we proceed towards uh, hatch opening and uh, you know eventually the crews meeting each other and going through the welcome ceremony, but we did get confirmation that uh, we did uh, pass the vestibule leak check. And so um, on the APAS, uh, on the International Space Station side, uh, things are continuing to progress, and it looks also sounds like the Ax Axiom One crew um, is working towards, um, you know, uh, getting uh, the Dragon Hatch open as well. Yeah, good news there all the way around. Uh, something interesting to note is uh, their conversation or their back and forth on tracking things like stowage and consumables. You heard their conversation on how to track the water or the uh, beverages that they were consuming and how best to manage that. That actually, um, you know, speaks to a big part of life in low Earth orbit. Tracking these kinds of things um, like, you know, uh, beverage packets, where exactly they're stored, how they're stored are all uh, extremely important in terms of um, you know management of life in low earth orbit they have to know these things uh, so that they know you know how much uh, what they need to send up on resupply missions how much trash they generate because that's you know trash management is a pretty big issue uh, on orbit um, and you know it's all part of a coordinated dance between all teams to uh, keep life smooth uh, while in orbit. Yeah, um, certainly space um, in the ISS uh, or space in low Earth orbit in general um, is is very uh, it is a very important resource. So you can even see on screen right now we're looking at um, uh, Kayla and. Uh, I believe that's Thomas Marshburn uh, working towards opening the A-pass hatch, but um, you can see behind them in that corridor, there's tons of um, storage there. So really... Station Endeavor, Houston, on the big loop. We have configured for hardline comm. Uh, when you have a moment, we'd appreciate comm checks on the big loop. Has you loud and clear on the big loop. So as I was saying, there's uh, here's an even better view of all of the storage that uh, is being put in the corridor. We're on the big loop for comm check. Endeavor station has you loud and clear. And Houston Endeavor, 
on the big loop. Come check. We have you loud and clear as well, LA. Good contracts all around. Appreciate the help, guys. Space X and Denver on dragging the ground for water. Space X ready to copy on dragging the ground. Hey, Jake. Uh, looking ahead in 4.400 now in section 5. We need a. Uh, bottle of water to flush the toilet, so you can take that out of bag 203. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. I think those calls have been coming in on the big loop, uh, but copy bag 203 for final water bottle and uh, waste system flush. Yes, sir. that's my bad. You're right now. I'm back on dragging the ground. Copy all, Mike. No worries. So, yeah, continuing to track inventory, as you mentioned, Tricia. Um, Thomas Marshburn, uh, we saw him earlier, but he's working on a tablet, and um, uh, we heard the communications back and forth that the team is going through each procedure and each step uh, and really just following the flight operations and docking operations uh, to make sure that uh, everything um, has been done and checked off before we can really get into the A-pass hatch opening and the Dragon hatch opening. Yeah, absolutely. And you heard earlier that we did dock about 45 minutes behind schedule, which meant that the rest of the crew schedule for the day was um, uh, pushed back by 45 minutes, or at least the next uh, two events on the crew schedule. So um, that also speaks to a big part of station life, and that crew time is extremely valuable and tracked very, very closely, sometimes even down to the second. Uh, this is to make sure that the crew is able to focus on things like scientific research, uh, exercise, getting enough sleep, and just maximizing the efficiency of their days uh, on orbit. Although they do get, you know, downtime. Uh, like yeah. we mentioned, the uh, AX-1 crew is docking uh, and ingressing into the station during crew weekend for Expedition 67 crew. So, um, you know, there are there are times to have some fun. <laughs> so they can get to enjoy their time on space, do, do some flips, and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, live in microgravity. Dragon, SpaceX on on dragging the ground or suit doffing. Go ahead, Jake. Hey, Mike. Uh, we're seeing indications that suit one has come undone from its umbilical. I want to confirm that the suit is dry or that uh, otherwise this was intended. It was intended, uh, mistakenly, we were just confused on the timing, so we're connecting that one again. The other three are still connected, and we're going for the one hour. Okay, Dragon, copy all. Sorry to play Big Brother, uh, and uh, as you were. So we are in a short handover period, but we should get views back of the International Space Station. Uh, but right before the video had cut off, we did see Thomas Marshburn open up the A-pass hatch, which is another significant milestone uh, in the, um, the docking procedure. So um, that is great news. I believe he was working on uh, removing the docking target, uh, which is affixed to the other side of the A-pass hatch. Um, that is what is used when Dragon was um, using his LiDAR to uh, dock with the space station. So that's gonna be removed, and, and then the hatch will remain open, and then we'll just wait on um, Dragon Hatch to open and the, the, the a, uh, AX-1 crew. Houston station on the big loop, the A-pass hatch is open, no condensate in the vestibule. Good news, thanks for the report, Kayla.
So yeah, things are continuing to go um, well. Uh, we'll wait for the Dragon Hatch to open up next. Um, it will be uh, a few moments from now. Yeah, you heard, uh, you know, several uh, back and forth between all the teams involved in coordinating this, uh, you know, it, and making sure that everyone's timeline and the order of steps that they're going in and the procedures that they're executing are, um, you know, everyone's in track with one another um, really highlights the importance of communication between all the teams. So after the docking target comes off, uh, we will be affixing a hatch cover on the A-pass hatch. As Kayla and Tom Marshburn continue to work um, in microgravity. And this is something that the AX crew, especially the folks um, that uh, haven't been to space before, are going to have to get used to. Kayla and um, uh, Tom here seem to be very fluid in their movements, uh, zipping around and, and you know uh, doing what they need to. But um, you know we've heard before from previous astronauts that it can be can take a little bit of time uh, to get used to movement and work in microgravity. So uh, we'll see um, you know how the AX crew. Uh, performs when they uh, eventually leave the Dragon and make their way to the ISS. Absolutely. And as they continue to make headway into hatch operations, we'll take it back to Dan Hewitt over at JSC for an update. Hey, thanks, Tricia and Andy. You guys nailed it. We got one of the hatches open, the A-pass hatch. There's a couple of steps that uh, the crew has to go through now. The first is Andy said we're removing that docking target, so it's kind of a cross uh, mechanism that uh, is sticking out, and so obviously you want to you want to take that off, as otherwise that's going to impede your progress <laughs> through the hatch. Um, so they'll they'll remove that, get the hatch stowed, and then they uh, install a hatch cover just to provide a little bit of extra padding on the hatch, just in case it gets bumped, protecting both the hatch hardware and the crew members. Um, then we're going to see them. Uh, move up uh, what's known as an IMV duct, an intramodular ventilation duct. Uh, if you can see that kind of large orange hose there, um, that is going to help uh, and eventually is going to get dragged into the Dragon spacecraft um, to actually integrate its atmosphere with the rest of stations. So that's where we're able to uh, provide essentially a positive flow integrating Dragon uh, with the rest of the station stack. Um, so Dragon will be able to take advantage of station oxygen generation, carbon dioxide scrubbing, temperature control, everything. Uh, essentially just becoming almost another module uh, while it's docked to the space station. So they'll drag that ducting in, um, get it ready, and then we'll step into hatch equalization. And so this is uh, just making sure that the pressure uh, on either side of the Dragon hatch is equal, or as close to equal as possible. We can have a little bit of variance. Um, and once that's done, then it'll be time for the Dragon crew to open up the hatch on their side. So they'll uh, just stand by, they're able to monitor, uh, and actually they can see through a small window in the Dragon hatch um, and look at everything that uh, Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron are doing here inside the pressurized mating adapter. Um, so you can see them storing that stuff. We're going to get the cover um, over the uh, A-pass hatch next and then just get closer to that hatch opening. Again, we're about 45 minutes behind schedule for docking. Uh, we were expecting the hatch on Dragon uh, to be open just about 10 minutes ago. Um, so right now our timeline puts us at 
approximately 9.15 or so central, we could be moving that up uh, if the crews are able to get through the steps quickly uh, before we get that Dragon hatch opened. And then after that's opened, uh, the AX-1 astronauts will be able to move through. They'll come down uh, through the the top hatch, the space-facing side of the Harmony module, make their way into Node 2, uh, where we'll then get everybody set up, the entire Expedition 67 crew, and all four of our AX-1 astronauts newly arrived and be able to execute a welcome ceremony. Um, there we can see Dragon Endeavor. It's docked uh, to that space-facing port on Node 2. We've got two docking adapters right now uh, that work for any U.S.-based vehicles that dock uh, as opposed to berthing to the space station like the previous version of Dragon. Um, and with this new arrival, we have two crewed versions, uh, two Dragons capable of carrying crew docked at the space station. We've got Endeavor uh, making a return to the space station, um, famously being uh, the first to fly astronauts, uh, Bob Enkin and Doug Hurley, to the station on uh, Demo 2, the, the first human space flight on the Dragon system. Uh, and then out of view, but essentially to the left of this camera view, uh, is the uh, Crew Dragon Endurance docked to the forward hatch of uh, the exact same module, Node 2. And that carried uh, NASA's SpaceX Crew 3 astronauts, uh, including Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron, who we can see continue doing the hatch operations uh, to the space station last fall. So for right now, the crew continuing to step through the procedures. Uh, Tom Marshburn uh, almost done uh, with the hatch hops again. He's going to get the cover on, and then they're going to work to get that ducting uh, up to uh, get secured in the vestibule, uh, and then it can get mated after we get the hatch open uh, to help integrate the dragging cabin with the rest of the station atmosphere. And then the station crew will give a call down that uh, they're ready for hatch equalization, uh, as well as the Dragon crew uh, giving that same call down. And then we'll get a call up uh, from uh, the Capcom here in Houston, just telling the crew to stand by and giving a rough estimate on how long we expect that hatch equalization to take. And then once that's completed, we can get into the Dragon hatch open. And that, that the hatch gets opened on the Dragon side. It can be opened from either side by its design. Uh, but just following the normal procedures, it's going to be opened by the Dragon crew. Uh, and there's a decal actually on the hatch that just gives the instructions uh, for how to operate the hatch opening mechanism on board. And then after we get the Dragon hatch open, the crew will come on board and we'll get them all gathered together for a formal welcome ceremony on board the station. If you've ever watched a crew arrive, it's going to look very similar to that. This is something we do uh, with all of our new arrivals at the space station, uh, just to formally give them a welcome and uh, begin their stay on board. Once that's completed, though, they're going to get right to work with Tom Marshburn leading uh, the entire crew through uh, just an initial orientation that'll include all of the, the current residents of the station as well as the AX-1 astronauts as uh, so they just go through a safety briefing with him just walking through a reminder of where all the emergency hardware is, what their actions are uh, in the event of any kind of emergency, just going over um, paths, hatch operations, things of that nature, uh, as this is all stuff that gets trained on the ground and then refreshers are always done right after new crew members arrive on orbit. Uh, and this is training that any individual flying to the space station goes through. Um, we've talked pretty extensively in the lead up to the flight um, over the, the differences in training between uh, a traditional long duration astronaut and uh, one of the astronauts on the AX-1 mission. Uh, one thing that is absolutely the exact same is that they receive emergency training. That, that safety training is that 
first and foremost, um, to have an effective response, every single member of the crew has to know what their job is in the event of an emergency. And so they'll just do that safety briefing. And then for Expedition 67, they'll largely get the rest of the day off. They have um, some cargo ops uh, on their timeline to uh, either unpack items that just flew up or just to assist the AX-1 crew uh, in offloading some of the cargo that they brought with them. And meanwhile, uh, Tom Marshburn will also uh, just spend a couple hours walking the newly arrived astronauts uh, just through an orientation, essentially, uh, shows up on their timeline as something called crew handover, uh, just getting them acquainted with the surroundings, uh, walking them through the basics of um, where they'll be able to do uh, toiletry and hygiene uh, functions, where the galley is, where water dispensers are, things of that nature, um, just to get them reoriented uh, with where they're going to be living and working uh, for more than the next week. So all of that's still to come for now, though. Uh, we're still in these hatch operations, um, waiting for additional confirmations. Uh, but right now it's Tom Marshburn continuing to work uh, on the station side. We did get confirmation that APAS, so the station side hatch is open. Um, so he's removed a docking target, he's affixing a cover, and then getting some of the inner module ventilation set up uh, before we then get ready for hatch equalization. Um, so we'll get a call from the crew on station, call from the crew on Dragon, and then a go from the ground and giving a rough approximation of how long we expect that to take. Um, but if we follow uh, the timeline as it was written out, uh, taking into account our roughly 45-minute uh, late docking time, we should be uh, within a half an hour of that Dragon hatch open. So we'll continue to follow along. We'll give you the updates as we hear them called out. Everything continuing on board the station to welcome AX-1 on board. And SpaceX station is ready for Dragon Hatch equalization. So we just Copy heard that, and we'll stand another by step for completed. Endeavor's call for their half. So as mentioned, the station calling down first that they're ready for hatch equalization. Now we'll stand by for a call from the Crew Dragon Endeavor astronauts that they're ready for equalization. Uh, the, the ethos, the life support, and environmental system officer here in Houston uh, reporting we should take only about two minutes for this hatch equalization to take place. Um, so we might be uh, hopefully jumping ahead on our timeline now. station on the big loop. Uh, we are also ready for hatch equalization. Copy that, Endeavor. Dragon, SpaceX on Stand by Dragon for Ground or Waste System Flash. Expected to take two minutes once we get started. Copy. Go ahead, Jake. 
Dragon. Uh, as you heard on the big loop, we are marching towards hatch open. Uh, last step there is hatch equalization, about two minutes for that. Um, we are tracking the waste system flush as the last big item to be completed in Dragon. want to make sure it's on your agenda as well. Yes, Jake, good read. It is on our agenda. I thought it would be appropriate to skip that to get to the hatch open unless you think otherwise. Hey Mike, uh, glad we're talking about it. The hatch is going to mechanically block the waste system and for that reason it's required to do this flush uh, before hatch open. That's a great call. There's always a good reason for that. We'll put that in work right now. Thanks for working through that, Mike. All right, so both the station and Dragon crews have reported their readiness for hatch equalization uh, on board Dragon. They do have to do a flush of the waste disposal system first. And how's the uh, audio? Five, four, three, two, one.
And continuing to get a view inside of Node 2, looking up at the space-facing hatch. That's where Crew Dragon Endeavor has docked. Tom Marshburn there. Uh, we just heard him do an audio check on the mic. We're going to see them use for that welcome ceremony. The station hatch is open. Uh, and we were just waiting for the crew on Dragon to do a final flush of that waste disposal system, after which we'll be able to step into hatch equalization. So that's just making sure pressures equalize, pressures essentially equal to each other uh, on either side of the Dragon hatch. And then the MCCX team and Hawthorne will give the Dragon crew a go to begin opening up that hatch. Um, we only expect that equalization to take about two minutes. Um, so it should happen pretty quickly. And then once that hatch is open, we'll be able to welcome the AX-1 astronauts on board. getting a pretty unique view here. This is that centerline camera that we were watching uh, during the final phases of Dragon's Approach. And as we are now docked, and it's right at, at the top hatch point, um, this is looking inside of the pressurized mating adapter, the PMA, um, where you can see NASA astronaut Kayla Barron there uh, just up and outside of the hatchway looking in. Um, so this was the camera feed that we were working to get routed over to the crew. Uh, during that final approach um, and still turned on at this point uh, but once the hatch, op hatch is opened uh, we will lose this view um, but we are just still standing by for the dragon hatch to get opened uh, we'll get into uh, hatch equalization momentarily and as soon as we get into that we expect it to only take about two minutes for the pressures to equalize and then the dragon crew will get the go to open up the hatch
And this is Mission Control Houston just still waiting for that hatch open to take place. Uh, getting this really cool split screen view though, uh, as we're looking on the left at a camera inside of the station node two, the Harmony module, and it's looking up at the space facing of the Zenith port where Crew Dragon's currently docked. And then on the right there, uh, the uh, center line media camera uh, on the Dragon spacecraft looking inside of station. It's looking inside the uh, pressurized mating adapter number three, on top of which is international docking adapter number three, where uh, the Crew Dragon Endeavor docked successfully uh, just about an hour and a half ago with that docking at 729 Central. So again, we're just standing by for the hatch equalization to begin. We expect it's only take about two minutes and that's just to ensure pressures are equal on uh, either sides of the Dragon hatch. Uh, so essentially in the Dragon cabin atmosphere uh, and in that vestibule and PMA area just on the other side. And the Dragon crew will get to go to open the hatch. There's a decal on the Dragon hatch, which can be open from either side, uh, but it's gonna get opened on the Dragon side uh, following the nominal timeline. And then after we get the hatches open, there's a couple of immediate steps uh, just to configure Dragon um, for its long-term dock duration to the space station where it's gonna be uh, for more than a week uh, docked to that uh, upper part of uh, node two. Uh, there's a couple of steps they have to take to just uh, essentially prep uh, Dragon for that docked ops. They're gonna uh, safe or remove uh, some of the LIO cartridge, uh, the lithium hydroxide cartridge that's used to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere while Dragon's in free flight. Um, they just steal that up and store it temporarily, and then it gets reinstalled once Dragon's ready uh, to go out and uh, execute its free flight return. SpaceX Endeavour, Dragon to Ground. Dragon, SpaceX, ready to copy on Dragon to Ground. We are really ready for Dragon Hatch opening now with the uh, urine flush complete. And uh, would you like me to make that call in the big loop? Okay, copy all Dragon. We'll follow you into 4.400, section six. We've got one command to send, and then I'll uh, send a call on the big loop. Copy that. All right, and Dragon, now we are SpaceX ready for on Dragon to ground. One quick note, uh, wondering if we can come on board with cameras. That's affirmative, Jake. Come on board. Copy Dragon. We'll be on board imminently. And the camera is being turned on once again inside Dragon. We should be able to join them momentarily. Uh, but getting the go is we're now about to execute hatch equalization. We only expect that to take about two minutes. It'll be a command sent from the ground to the Dragon spacecraft from MCCX out in Hawthorne. 
Once that's complete, the crew will get to go to open up the hatch. SpaceX and ground also reporting 4.102, sorry, 1.2 is complete, 4.012. Copy all mic on suit doffing completion. And getting views inside of Endeavour once more, looking over uh, the shoulders of Commander and Pilot. Uh, you heard them report suits have been docked, so they're out of their flight suits, or they're out of their spacesuits, rather, uh, and those have been stowed away, now in flight suits and awaiting the hatch open operations. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground. We're standing by for final equalization. Uh, stand by for a call on the big loop. Okay, Jake, and just uh, to give you a heads up, we are now looking at 2.102, step 6.3. We suspect that that should say on MCC X go, but let us know if that's a mistake. So again, we're just standing by for that final hatch equalization. It'll be a command from MCZX in Hawthorne. That'll get sent up to Dragon, and they'll equalize pressures on either side of the hatch. Then the crew will get to go uh, on the Dragon side to open up the hatch and make their way inside the International Space Station. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground for 2.102 clarification. We see step 6.3 and confirm it is an MCCH go. Uh, that's after the hatch is open, uh, sort of a handover to the ISS uh, crew. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, well, one of you guys tells us to do it, we'll do it.
Dragon Station SpaceX on the big loop, go for hatch opening per decal, followed by the remaining actions in 4.400, Section 6. Endeavor copies in work. All right, good news there. We're through hatch equalization. The crew's been given the go to open it up. And so there is a decal on the hatch itself. It shows them how to work the hatch mechanism. They're gonna open it up and it swings inside of the Dragon spacecraft to get stowed. Uh, after they get it open, they'll have a couple of steps um, just to configure Dragon for docked ops. They're gonna uh, install a hatch seal cover just to protect that seal around the open hatchway. Um, as people are moving in and out. I'm also installing a cover uh, over the hatch itself. And now we're just standing by the hatch. Uh, the hatch is open. Copy that, hatch and open. There we go, hatch opening. The hatch opened. And the hatch opened at 9.13 a.m. Central Time. It's 14.13 GMT, 7.13 for the teams over in Hawthorne. So now they're gonna install that hatch seal and a cover over the hatch itself, and then start making their way on board the station. But the hatch is open. Nothing but space in between Crew Dragon Endeavor and the space station. And we're just standing by for the crew to start making their way through. Again, the hatch open on Dragon. So hatch open on the station side uh, some time ago. Hatch now open on Dragon. They've got a couple of steps just to prepare Dragon for docked. Uh, it's docked configuration. And then we should start to see them make their way through the pressurized mating adapter and into the International Space Station. So continuing to stand by, uh, we can see uh, the AX-1 astronaut still inside Dragon. And we should see them start making their way out momentarily. So 
Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn making his way down, and there we are. So Aton Sibby, first one through, followed shortly after by Mark Pathy making his way onto the space station. Looks like just behind him is going to be Larry Connor, the pilot for the AX-1 mission. Now through the hatchway into node two. Mark adjusting our camera angle for us. And then making his way out of a spacecraft named Endeavor onto the space station for the second time. Uh, no stranger to the orbiting lab, Mike Lopez Alegria. So with the entire AX-1 crew now on board, uh, we're going to spend a couple minutes just getting everybody set up, and then we'll be able to kick off our welcome ceremony. Copy that, we're taking a look, we'll let you know. We can see the crew gathering here in No2 in the Harmony module. The Expedition 67 crew welcoming the AX-1 astronauts on board. Uh, there's still a couple of steps to get through, and then once we're 
uh, done with our initial configs on board, we'll be able to we'll be able to get into this welcome ceremony. So a short handover now with the, the video link. Uh, it's likely the crew will have a couple of tasks to take uh, before we get into that welcome ceremony, but good to see uh, them all making their way on board. Uh, as mentioned, there's a couple of, of post docking configurations, uh, steps that have to take place on board Dragon, um, namely uh, sealing up a lithium hydroxide canister that's used to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere while Dragon's in free flight. Uh, also getting a hatch seal and a hatch cover on. So uh, it's looking like the crew might get the call to go through those steps. Uh, and then following that, we'll be able to uh, kick off our welcome ceremony. Uh, so Tom's going to do the grab sample, and I assume we see they're talking about like the LIO swap out uh, for the post hatch opening activity. Hey, copy. That's uh, in work, and we'll let you know when it's done. And so a couple of quick tasks for the crew uh, just before we get uh, into the welcome ceremony. Again, they got to go uh, seal that Lyo canister inside Dragon. They're going to take it out, uh, seal it up, and it's going to stay stowed until uh, they unseal it and reinstall it when Dragon's ready to depart the space station. Uh, also getting uh, that hatch seal on. Commander Tom Marshburn's also going to use a, a grab sample container just to get uh, an instantaneous air sample um, in the in that hatchway between the two, and that's just another standard procedure. Um, Houston and Deborah on the big loop. We're looking for a go from you in section uh, six, step one, six point two of two dot one oh two. And Endeavor, Houston copies that. Apologies, to make that 6.3. Yes, sir. For 6.3, we concur. But before we do that, we need confirmation from you that you have the IMV duct installation complete in step 6.1. Copy. Uh, 
And so again, the crew uh, moved back up towards Dragon just to, to step through some of those post-docking uh, procedures. One of them is getting an IMV and intermodular ventilation duct installed. And that's just to begin circulating the cabin air from station through the cabin of the Dragon spacecraft as we continue to further integrate it into the station stack. Uh, they're also removing that LIO cartridge sealing up, sealing it up and then stowing it and then getting a hatch cover on the Dragon hatch and a uh, hatch seal cover around that seal um, just to give it some extra protection as folks are moving in and out of it over time. And then they'll make their way back into node two here and then we'll be able to officially and formally welcome the AX-1 crew on board. So that'll just take a couple of minutes uh, for all of that to get done. Again, just to put Dragon into its configuration for extended docked operations. Once we get through that, we'll get to our welcome ceremony, after which the uh, AX-1 crew will join the rest of Expedition 67 in a safety briefing, just doing a refresher of uh, what they trained on the ground, uh, going over all the different safety features of the International Space Station, uh, including exit paths uh, and also the location of emergency gear. And then the AX-1 astronauts have a, a couple okay, hours of handover built in. Copy that, Endeavor. Give us 30 seconds. We're going to activate the fan. Once that's done, I'll come back with a go for you in 6.3. All right, and so they have that, that IMV, that intermodular ventilation uh, now installed. And so the teams here on the ground in Houston are going to enable it um, from Mission Control Houston, essentially turning the fan on. And that's just going to give uh, a positive pressure to start circulating atmosphere through the Dragon capsule with the rest of station. And then uh, per his procedures, uh, Mike L.A. is going to take a look and just make sure there's no debris uh, under a panel um, uh, on that uh, air circulation and then he's going to move into uh, s removing the uh, lithium Station hydroxide Endeavor, Houston, uh, back with you on canister here. inside uh, right. You are go to proceed in step 6.3 and I want to relay also from the SpaceX team here uh, if you guys can uh, circle back when that's done to uh, procedure 4.400, uh, section 6. Sounds like you've got a couple small steps left to complete in that uh, procedure as well. All right, copy all, Scott. That's in work. We see one of our AX-1 crew members, Aton Stibby, uh, there in node two. We're gonna see the rest of them start to gather as they're just going through the final stages of getting Dragon configured for docked operations. We've successfully hooked up and turned on uh, the IMV fan, just integrating Dragon's cabin atmosphere with that of station. Right now, uh, the spacecraft commander, Mike L.A., 
uh, working to remove the lithium hydroxide canister, which is used to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere while Dragon's in free flight. That'll get sealed up and stored away, and then it'll get unsealed and reinstalled uh, when it's time for Dragon to undock and come home. They have several of these canisters on board to provide that critical life support function. And he's getting some assistance right now inside Dragon from uh, some of the Crew-3 astronauts who went through essentially the exact same procedures uh, when they docked the station in Crew Dragon Endurance. So very familiar with the procedures, giving him a hand to help uh, things get done as quickly as possible. They're also going to be installing a cover on the Dragon hatch uh, and also on the hatch seal, uh, just giving uh, both of those critical items some extra protection as folks are going to be moving in and out of Dragon uh, over the coming days. Uh, one of the AX-1 crew members is going to be sleeping inside Dragon during the dock stay. But again, once we get all these steps wrapped up, the rest of the crew is going to gather here in Node 2, the Harmony module, and then we'll be able to kick off our formal welcome to the first private astronaut mission ever to the International Space Station. And we're just continuing to stand by while the crew continues to configure endurance for its docked uh, operations on board the station. Dragon, SpaceX, it does appear that they've the successfully... Go ahead on the big loop, Jake. 
Mike, uh, we saw you do some audio reconfiguration there. Uh, our ask is that you leave audio in the current configuration, uh, what you just did, push to talk to ISS. That's one. Uh, how copy? Sounds good. Second item is that we're hoping you can step through 4.406.9 to disable backup lighting on the control panel. Yes, we will definitely do that. We're working through uh, 2.102 right now, which uh, has a higher priority for you. Copy you working through 2.102 as well. Uh, feel free to prioritize that. Uh, we have an eye on step 7.2 uh, in 2.102 and letting you know that you do have a go to perform the manual override on the AVV uh, panel. Okay, not required. All of the valves are in the closed position, and I also, if you didn't hear it, reported earlier that the Lyle cartridge is sealed and installed. Okay, copy, Mike. Uh, understand all valves indicate closed. No manual override needed. That's a good copy. All right, so continuing to tick off uh, some of the steps to get Dragon ready for docked ops, uh, we confirmed that the LIO, the lithium hydroxide canister, has been sealed and stowed. And then Spacecraft Commander Michael Lake confirming that all the Dragon vent valves are in the proper closed configuration. The only other items which we did see, they were getting some assistance from NASA astronaut Kayla Barron is getting the hatch and the uh, hatch seal covers fully installed. And again, those just give some additional protection uh, to both the forward hatch and that hatch seal uh, during the docked operations as individuals are moving in and out of Dragon. Meanwhile, we see half of our AX-1 crew uh, standing by in Node 2, along with NASA astronaut and the current Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn. And then once we're complete hey, with these six, final steps, then we'll the the rest of the crew is on board. That's Dragon arrival configuration is complete for 2.102. Dragon SpaceX, we copy. Houston copies it well as well. Thank you. And so that completes all of their steps and their arrival through hatch opening procedures, meaning they've got the hatch and the hatch seal covers installed. All of their uh, tools have been stowed, and they're ready to start making their way out of Dragon and on into station. So we should see the rest of the crew come out of Dragon momentarily and then start gathering everybody inside of Node 2. We have 11 people on board the International Space Station right now.
Um, so yeah, you got the grab sample. Let's stow to the staging bag. SpaceX Endeavor on the big loop. Uh, procedure 4.400 is complete. Dragon, SpaceX, we see the same. Great working with you, Mike. I think this is the last you'll hear from me today. And uh, next call, knock on wood, will be from Mike on the undock. All right, Jake. Great working with you, Kaylee, and the team. A uh, little bit of a delay, but that's been the story for AX1 so far. It's uh, all worth the wait. Thank you, guys. Station Houston on two. We are ready to do a quick scene check. If everyone wants to get in view, we'll do that, and then we can uh, get into the PAO event very soon. Just a heads up for you, we do expect a quick handover to happen at uh, 1450, uh, so just be aware of that during the event. All right, well, we now have Dragon in its dock configuration. No more calls. We got the uh, handover at 1450, and we will start gathering the forces here under the scene. over now to the Capcom here in Houston. Thank the AX-1 crew join all of the astronauts on board the station. And now as we get everybody set up, we should be just moments away now, kicking off our formal welcome ceremony for the first private astronaut mission to the space station. and the crew working to try and get our camera reoriented uh, so we can hopefully try and uh, get a view of all 11 people now living on board the space station. And guys, we like the scene. Looking good there. We should be able to get started here momentarily. Stand by.
And Tom, back with you real quick. I think you were trying to talk on the mic, but I think it might have been off. Could you uh, give another comm check real quick? Okay, comm check. Five, four, three, two, one. How do you copy? And we're hearing you. And Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Everybody loud and clear. Station is ready for the event. Kathy Leaders, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Hey, I think we already did that. I think, hey, I I think we already did that. Tom. I, I apologize. We, that. we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Tom, I don't know if you muted again. The microphone is, is on, and we uh, read you loud and clear, and we're ready to speak with you. Okay, well, I had an old boss whose his, uh, his greatest praise was when you heard him say, nicely done. Old? <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, all I can say is uh, nicely done, and, and to the whole team, um, the SpaceX, Axiom, station team, and, uh, you know, Mike here, uh, I know that the, ex the Expedition 67 crew is very happy to see your crew. Um, I know Mike and I are very happy to see all of you there and, and seeing the new crew coming on board, um, looking so uh, healthy and happy to be there, and I'm personally very happy to see how, how good the Expedition 67 crew looks also. Raja, I didn't know you grew a mustache, so um, it's, it's, always, it's always fun to see um, our crews there getting ready to go do a lot of work. I know the team has a lot of things lined up to do over this next week, and uh, this is going to be important for us to be able to work as a team for our Expedition 67 folks to get the important work that they need to get done. But then Mike, obviously your team to be able to get their work done too. So we're looking forward to see all the exciting things that are going to be going on and, uh, and then seeing everybody make it safely home. In just a short momentary handover, we'll get that communication back real quickly with the space station and then continue through our welcome. So, Mike, do you have a few words? And Houston, I believe we're back with you. Hey, Tom, this is uh, this is stuff. Can you guys hear us? It's good to hear you, stuff. We can read you loud and clear. Great. Well, first, um, let me let me thank you and uh, Expedition sixty seven crew for uh, welcoming our crew on board. Um, we're very excited to uh, to be there, of course. Uh, Mike, Larry, Aton, Mark, you guys look great. Uh, the the uh, dragon ride looks like uh, 
uh, that sat with you well. Uh, so um, first, I'll say uh, thanks to our to our SpaceX team for getting you there. Uh, we that was really awesome. Uh, my thanks to NASA for uh, for hosting us and to the entire crew. You know, we've been talking about this uh, history making mission for a long time. So we're going to stop talking about it now and just get on with it. So uh, you guys have a great, uh, a great mission. We we'll look forward to it. And uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to uh, L.A. to uh, do the pinning ceremony. Hey, Mike and Kathy, uh, thanks for greeting us on board. I got to tell you, this is it's quite an experience. Um, I, I can't even begin to describe how fun it's been to be in Dragon for the last day and a half or so watching um, these guys faces light up. True story. You know, we had just reached uh, orbit and getting out of our suits and I was, you know, busy at uh, doing commander stuff and one by one I could hear them say, expletive deleted as soon as they looked out the window literally every single one of them and i just smiled a little bit and then when i got my turn to look at it same expletive it's just an amazing experience anyway um you know there's a tradition that when you cross a certain boundary and that boundary is debatable but in the united states it's 50 miles uh you become an astronaut in altitude and uh, that happened to these three gentlemen for the first time yesterday. Um, it was a pretty exciting moment. We were in the middle of first stage, but we noted it. And now I'd like to note it a little more officially. Um, there is a very special pin that NASA astronauts wear that is gold and designed by the original Mercury 7. But um, until recently, there has been no internationally recognized pin. So. None of the other five, or I should say other four space agencies, nor do the Chinese that I know of have a symbol that people wear in civilian clothes for, um, for commemorating that they're astronauts. So a little while ago, the Association of Space Explorers, which encompasses a lot of members from 38 different countries of flown astronauts, uh, decided to commission such a pin. And I happen to have three of them in my hand. Tom, would you break them out for me? And uh, when I pin these on, I think the numbers will be 582, 583, and 584, respectively, for uh, Larry, Aton, and Mark. I hope they will wear these with the pride that they deserve. And then I'm going to let Larry say something while I pin his, et cetera. Yeah, well, first off, uh, probably words don't describe it. I mean, I'm thrilled and honored to be up here. Thanks to SpaceX, phenomenal ride. I mean, no pun intended, but out of this world. Thanks to uh, Axiom for making this uh, dream come true. Thanks to NASA. Thanks to all the crew. Unbelievably uh, welcome. And yeah, we're here to experience this. But we understand there's a responsibility, and the responsibility is for this first civilian crew to get it right. And that's what we're fully committed to with the support of everybody here at the ISS and, uh, and on the ground. So it's going to be a busy week of research for us, and uh, I'm sure it's going to fly by. And now I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Aton. I'll take the opportunity. I need to press something. I think it's to say a few words in Hebrew on the International Space Station. Buchim abayim le tachanat achala la ben lomit pa mrishona shev shal le daber po bo ivrit zachinu liot chelak mitzvet shel achadesre shenikra Expedition 67. זה, זה קבוצת עבודה שתעבוד ביחד, כולנו ביחד נעזור אחד לשני להשיג את המטרות, כל אחד בא עם תוכנית עבודה מלאה, ובהצלחה לכולם, בהצלחה לרקיע. מרק. תודה רבה, איתן. 
making your way to us and then to come on board and, and be so, uh, so warmly greeted by all of you. That was great. Thanks a lot. And looking forward to spending the next uh, few days. Sorry, I, I got to forget the, the look, look up there. Um, next few days here with all of you. And uh, wow, it's just amazing to be here. Um, it's, it's hard to find, find the words, but uh, it's been an amazing journey. And I don't, I'm not just talking about the last 24 hours. I'm talking about uh, everything that's got us here. It's, it's, been, it's been amazing. And thanks to, to uh, Mike and all the folks at Axiom uh, for, uh, for hatching this plan and, and getting it going, and, and to SpaceX and NASA for, uh, for making it happen as well. Thanks, everyone. And, and, and sorry, last but definitely not least, uh, all my family and friends who, uh, whose love and support made this possible. And we just want to say the uh, Expedition 67 crew, all of us are incredibly thrilled and excited to welcome Axiom on board. And uh, on this historic uh, day for uh, continued, we expect long-term uh, cooperation with uh, NASA, with our international partners, and with private companies and private astronauts. So we are ready to go to work. Thank you. Godspeed, everybody. Thank you, guys. Have fun. Okay, with that, AX-1 officially welcomed on board the International Space Station. So it was a very successful day. We got a little bit of uh, extra time there as we hung out about 20 meters from the space station, but everything completing as expected. Uh, we were able to dock AX-1 to the space station at 7.29 a.m. Central. It's 12.29 GMT. While well, they were flying just about 258 statute miles over the Atlantic, getting the hatches open a little less than two hours later, and four crew members, the first ever all-private astronaut mission to the space station, now on board and welcome. So it's going to be an extremely busy week for them ahead, but it was great to take everybody through the operation so far this morning. That's going to do it for me from Mission Control Houston. So I'll sign off and send it back to Andy and Tricia at Hawthorne. Thank you both for being with me this morning, and congratulations again on the successful docking of AX-1 to the station. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, congratulations to yourself, too. It's been a super exciting 24 hours. Uh, but that is going to wrap it up for us here uh, in Hawthorne, too, uh, for the live joint coverage of AX-1's arrival to the International Space Station. It has been an honor to support AX-1. Uh, we wish the Axiom crew a successful time on station, and we look forward to joining you when it's time to return home. Yes, it was certainly very exciting to see the camaraderie already building, and we're looking forward to what they'll accomplish in the next eight days. Starting Monday, April 11th, we will be providing daily updates from Axiom Mission Control to highlight the range of science research and STEAM events the crew will be conducting over their eight-day mission. Be sure to visit axiomspace.com and follow the Axiom social media channels for real-time updates. On behalf of SpaceX, Axiom Space, and NASA, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next time.
T-minus 30 seconds. T-minus 15 seconds. Chapter begins. Godspeed AX1. Stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 38 seconds into this historic mission, flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9. All right, telemetry nominal. Stage one throttle down. Throttling down in the preparation for max dynamic pressure. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Next cue. Stage one throttle up. Merlin 1D engines coming back up to power. Copy, one Bravo. The crew calling out one Bravo should a escape situation arise. It tells the Dragon flight computer what profile to fly using the Super Draco engines. But everything is looking good on Falcon 9. We're getting nominal call outs from all the engineers and a great view from the ground camera and the onboard cameras. In back chill underway. Beginning to chill in the second stage turbo pump in preparation for its ignition coming up in just over half a minute from now. Coming up on about three and a half G's acceleration for the crew. We'll begin throttling down the Merlin engines to hold that period, that level of acceleration. Next event coming up, we're gonna get main engine cutoff stage of the one, main engines. Down. Get stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. You've heard the throttle down call out. We're holding three and a half G's for the crew. And Miko.
Good morning from Mission Control in Houston at the International Space Station Flight Control Room here at the Johnson Space Center. We are just one hour and change away from the homecoming of NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei and Russian cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov after almost a year in space for those two and 176 days in space for Soyuz Commander Anton Shkaplerov. The trio are suited up in their Sokol launch and entry suits, ready for a deorbit burn, a four minute, 39 second retrograde firing, a braking maneuver of the Soyuz MS-19 engine to uh, complete uh, the trip uh, in orbit for this trio that undocked from the International Space Station almost three hours ago. Everything aboard the Soyuz spacecraft is in readiness for the deorbit burn that will enable the Soyuz to drop out of orbit and begin its descent back into the Earth's atmosphere with all of its uh, systems honed in on a remote landing site southeast of the town of Jezkazgan, Kazakhstan, and a parachute-assisted landing that will bring to an end for Vandehei and Dubrov what amounts to a 150.6 million mile mission, the equivalent of some 312 round trips to the moon. Shkaplerov wrapping up 176 days in space, Vandehei and Dubrov wrapping up 355 days in space. For Vandehei, that is a record for a single space flight by a U.S. astronaut. Late uh, Tuesday night, the uh, departing crew members gathered in the Rosviet module of the International Space Station to uh, say their farewells. Van de Heij on the left, Dubrov and Shkaplerov nearby, Oleg Artemiev, uh, the newly arrived Russian cosmonaut, uh, by the hatchway as they said goodbye to their Expedition 66 counterparts and made their way through the hatch into the Soyuz MS-19 to begin undocking preparations. They conducted leak checks at the docking interface between the Soyuz and the Rosviet module, then suited up in their Soka launch and entry suits and uh, began uh, final preparations for the undocking of the Soyuz from the Rosviet module. That undocking uh, occurred at uh, 2.21 a.m. Central Time, 3.21 a.m. Eastern Time, as the International Space Station flew over the South Atlantic at an altitude of 260 statute miles. Slowly but surely, the Soyuz backed away from the Rosviet module. A uh, backaway burn uh, of 13 seconds enabled uh, the Soyuz to move to a distance of about 70 meters from the International Space Station, at which point uh, Soyuz Commander Anton Shkaplerov took over manual control of the flying of the Soyuz to enable his uh, cosmonaut crewmate, Pyotr Dubrov, to move into the upper section of the Soyuz or the orbital module to begin about 30 minutes of uh, videography and still photography of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Once uh, that was complete, uh, Dubrov uh, returned to the descent module, the center section of the three-section Soyuz spacecraft. He buckled up once again in the left seat, Shkaplerov in the center seat, and Mark Vandehei in the right seat of the descent module, preparing for the deorbit burn that is now just over 15 minutes from now. And there's our uh, Soyuz MS-19 under the orange and white parachute less than eight minutes before touchdown. Partly cloudy skies, temperatures in the mid-40s Fahrenheit. The search and recovery forces now have re-established contact with the crew on board uh, the Soyuz MS-19 under the command of Anton Shkaplerov. The uh, Soyuz uh, descending under its parachute, having jettisoned uh, the heat shield, and uh, having uh, vented, as planned, uh, a combination of hydrogen peroxide and uh, oxygen to uh, safe uh, the vehicle from uh, the dispelling of any toxic fuels after touchdown. We're just over seven minutes before landing to wrap up a year-long mission for Mark Vandehei and Pyotr Dubrov and 176 days in space for Anton Shkaplerov. All of the entry events have gone uh, as planned. The crew at last report indicating that they were feeling great. Oh, 
all of the uh, helicopters associated with the search and recovery forces and NASA support personnel on board are in a uh, circular uh, flying pattern around that landing zone with eyes on the uh, Soyuz under its main chute. The uh, crew is uh, talking with the search and recovery forces. And that's the where the familiar uh, radio beacon providing uh, uh, barometric landing uh, information and other systems information uh, to the Antonov 26 being relayed back to the Russian flight the controllers outside fine. of Moscow. Communication stopping. We're preparing for landing. We should uh, see the horizon uh, momentarily. There's one of the Russian MI-8 helicopters as we stand by for touchdown. Touchdown. Touchdown confirmed at 6.28 a.m. Central Time, 7.28 a.m. Eastern Time, 5.28 p.m. at the landing site. Mark Vandehei and Pyotr Dubrov back home one year after leaving the planet. Soyuz MS-19 under the command of Anton Shkaplerov back on Earth along with Mark Vandehei and uh, Pyotr Dubrov. A nominal entry, a perfect landing, a bullseye touchdown as the uh, Russian search and recovery forces in the Mi-8 helicopters uh, begin uh, the process of landing sequentially. There's one of those helicopters. They will be in the neighborhood of the uh, Soyuz capsule momentarily to begin first uh, to uh, erect an inflatable medical tent and then uh, safe the vehicle before the crew uh, is extracted from the spacecraft. They undocked uh, from the uh, Rosviet module of the International Space Station just over four hours ago at uh, 2.21 a.m. Central Time, 3.21 a.m. Eastern Time. The deorbit burn was executed less than an hour ago in perfect fashion, and all of the entry milestones of module separation, entry interface, and the deployment of the main parachute, as you saw, all of that went uh, as planned. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, some 24 minutes following the uh, landing of the Soyuz MS-19, you see uh, RSC uh, Energia and search and recovery personnel uh, working uh, on the continuing extraction of the other two crew members, Mark Vandehei and Pyotr Dubrov. Anton Shkaplerov was first out, as is typically the case with the Soyuz commander occupying the center seat. He uh, will always uh, be extracted first to open a pathway, if you will, for the extraction of the other two crew members. And Pyotr Dubrov. Outside of uh, the uh, Soyuz capsule, 355 days in space. He and Mark Van der Heij having launched together last April 9th. I wouldn't mind flying somewhere. 
Are we? You need to turn them around. Shkaplerov uh, being carried uh, into the nearby inflatable medical tent to Russian Mi-8 helicopters in the background. He'll be followed uh, shortly by Vandehai and Dubrov. They'll get out of their Sokol launch and entry suits into more comfortable flight uh, suits and will board the helicopters fun, for a two-hour we'll flight back to Karaganda, so the staging city, where the crew will split up at that point. Vandehai flying on a NASA jet back to Houston the two cosmonauts returning to Star City, Russia, outside of Moscow. What's that? Hey, hello, everybody. All three crew members now in that medical tent. They'll uh, undergo initial medical testing. The helicopter flight uh, from the landing site back to Karaganda is about two hours in duration. T minus 15 seconds. Chapter begins. Godspeed AX1. Stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 38 seconds into this historic mission, flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9. All right, telemetry nominal. Stage one throttle down. Throttling down in the preparation for max dynamic pressure. Falcon 9 is supersonic. XQ. Stage one throttle up. Berlin 1D engines coming Stage back up to power. One Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. The crew calling out one Bravo should a escape situation arise. It tells the Dragon flight computer what profile to fly using the Super Draco engines. But everything is looking good on Falcon 9. We're getting nominal callouts from all the engineers and a great view from the ground camera and the onboard cameras. Back chill underway. Beginning to chill in the second stage turbo pump in preparation for its ignition coming up in just over half a minute from now. Coming up on about three and a half G's acceleration for the crew. We'll begin throttling down the Merlin engines to hold that period, that level of acceleration.
Next event coming up, we're going to get main engine cutoff stage of the line engines. Down. Get stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. You've heard the throttle down call out. We're holding three and a half G's for the crew. And Miko.
Good morning from Mission Control in Houston at the International Space Station Flight Control Room here at the Johnson Space Center. We are just one hour and change away from the homecoming of NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei and Russian cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov after almost a year in space for those two and 176 days in space for Soyuz Commander Anton Shkaplerov. The trio are suited up in their Soka launch and entry suits, ready for a deorbit burn of 4 minute 39 second retrograde firing, a braking maneuver of the Soyuz MS-19 engine to uh, complete uh, the trip uh, in orbit for this trio that undocked from the International Space Station almost three hours ago. Everything aboard the Soyuz spacecraft is in readiness for the deorbit burn that will enable the Soyuz to drop out of orbit and begin its descent back into the Earth's atmosphere with all of its uh, systems honed in on a remote landing site southeast of the town of Jezkazgan, Kazakhstan, and a parachute-assisted landing that will bring to an end for Vandehei and Dubrov what amounts to a 150.6 million mile mission, the equivalent of some 312 round trips to the moon. Shkaplerov wrapping up 176 days in space, Vandehei and Dubrov wrapping up 355 days in space. For Vandehei, that is a record for a single space flight by a U.S. astronaut. Late uh, Tuesday night, the uh, departing crew members gathered in the Rosviet module of the International Space Station to uh, say their farewells. Vandehei on the left, Dubrov and Shkaplerov nearby, Oleg Artemiev, uh, the newly arrived Russian cosmonaut, uh, by the hatchway as they said goodbye to their Expedition 66 counterparts and made their way through the hatch into the Soyuz MS-19 to begin undocking preparations. They conducted leak checks at the docking interface between the Soyuz and the Rosviet module, then suited up in their Soka launch and entry suits and uh, began uh, final preparations for the undocking of the Soyuz from the Rosviet module. That undocking uh, occurred at uh, 2.21 a.m. Central Time, 3.21 a.m. Eastern Time, as the International Space Station flew over the South Atlantic at an altitude of 260 statute miles. Slowly but surely, the Soyuz backed away from the Rosviet module. A uh, backaway burn uh, of 13 seconds enabled uh, the Soyuz to move to a distance of about 70 meters from the International Space Station, at which point uh, Soyuz Commander Anton Shkaplerov took over manual control of the flying of the Soyuz to enable his uh, cosmonaut crewmate, Pyotr Dubrov, to move into the upper section of the Soyuz or the orbital module to begin about 30 minutes of uh, videography and still photography of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Once uh, that was complete, uh, Dubrov uh, returned to the descent module, the center section of the three-section Soyuz spacecraft. He buckled up once again in the left seat, Shkaplerov in the center seat, and Mark Vandehei in the right seat of the descent module, preparing for the Dior burn that is now just over 15 minutes from now. And there's our uh, Soyuz MS-19 under the orange and white parachute less than eight minutes before touchdown. Partly cloudy skies, temperatures in the mid 40s Fahrenheit. The search and recovery forces now have re-established contact with the crew on board uh, the Soyuz MS-19 under the command of Anton Shkaplerov. The uh, Soyuz uh, descending under its parachute, having jettisoned uh, the heat shield and uh, having uh, vented as planned uh, a combination of hydrogen peroxide and uh, oxygen to uh, safe uh, the vehicle from uh, the dispelling of any toxic fuels after touchdown. We're just over seven minutes before landing to wrap up a year-long mission for Mark Vandehei and Pyotr Dubrov and 176 days in space for Anton Shkaplerov. All of the entry events have gone uh, as planned. The crew at last report indicating that they were feeling great. Oh, 
All of the uh, helicopters associated with the search and recovery forces and NASA support personnel on board are in a uh, circular uh, flying pattern around that landing zone with eyes on the uh, Soyuz under its main chute. The uh, crew is uh, talking with the search and recovery forces. And that's the where the familiar uh, radio beacon providing um, uh, landing uh, information and other systems information uh, to the Antonov 26 being relayed back to the Russian flight the controllers outside fine. of Moscow. Communication stopping. We're preparing for landing. We should uh, see the horizon uh, momentarily. There's one of the Russian Mi-8 helicopters as we stand by for touchdown. Touchdown. Touchdown confirmed at 6.28 a.m. Central Time, 7.28 a.m. Eastern Time, 5.28 p.m. at the landing site. Mark Vandehei and Pyotr Dubrov back home one year after leaving the planet. Soyuz MS-19 under the command of Anton Shkaplerov back on Earth along with Mark Vandehei and uh, Pyotr Dubrov. A nominal entry, a perfect landing, a bullseye touchdown as the uh, Russian search and recovery forces in the Mi-8 helicopters uh, begin uh, the process of landing sequentially. There's one of those helicopters. They will be in the neighborhood of the uh, Soyuz capsule momentarily to begin first uh, to uh, erect an inflatable medical tent and then uh, safe the vehicle before the crew uh, is extracted from the spacecraft. They undocked uh, from the uh, Rosviet module of the International Space Station just over four hours ago at uh, 2.21 a.m. Central Time, 3.21 a.m. Eastern Time. The deorbit burn was executed less than an hour ago in perfect fashion, and all of the entry milestones of module separation, entry interface, and the deployment of the main parachute, as you saw, all of that went uh, as planned. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, some 24 minutes following the uh, landing of the Soyuz MS-19, you see uh, RSC uh, Energia and search and recovery personnel uh, working uh, on the continuing extraction of the other two crew members, Mark van de Heij and Pyotr Dubrov. Anton Shkaplerov was first out, as is typically the case with the Soyuz commander occupying the center seat. He uh, will always uh, be extracted first to open a pathway, if you will, for the extraction of the other two crew members. And Pyotr Dubrov. Outside of uh, the uh, Soyuz capsule, 355 days in space. He and Mark van de Heij having launched together last April 9th. I wouldn't mind flying somewhere. 
No way. You need to turn them around. Shkaplarov uh, being carried uh, into the nearby inflatable medical tent to Russian Mi-8 helicopters in the background. He'll be followed uh, shortly by Vandehai and Dubrov. They'll get out of their Sokol launch and entry suits into more comfortable flight uh, suits and will board the helicopters for a two-hour flight back to Karaganda, the staging city, where the crew will split up at that point. Vandehai flying on a NASA jet back to Houston, the two cosmonauts returning to Star City, Russia, outside of Moscow.